All right, good morning. I, uh, I'm Vlad Shalai from Purdue University. I will be chairing over this session, this morning session. We have two outstanding speakers today, and the first speaker is Professor Federico Capasso from Harvard. I guess you uh, all know as well as I do uh, that Federica uh, did a number of pioneering contributions to different areas of science and engineering, ranging from uh, quantum cascade lasers, we heard about this uh, last morning, to two-dimensional metamaterials or metasurfaces, and I believe that's the topic he is going to discuss today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Federica Capasso. Thank you, Vlad, for the introduction. I would like to thank the committee for the invitation. So I'm going to review the work done in my uh, group and with the collaborators uh, in, uh, in the general area of, uh, of metasurfaces, covering the range from achromatic uh, flat uh, uh, optics to some interesting implementation of uh, metasurfaces that we have called in metasurfaces with functional connectivity. Basically, they are disorder type of metasurfaces. So here are uh, the various uh, funding. And we are part, uh, I should say, of an Air Force MURI together with several in uh, uh, institutions, including Vlad from, uh, from Purdue, Neder and uh, in, uh, Geta Martong, you from uh, Columbia and, uh, and so forth on, in fact, metasurfaces. So I want first to acknowledge all my collaborators. These are present and former members of my group at, uh, at Harvard. As you see, it's quite a long list. They've migrated. They're kind of they're all over the world, most, most uh, continents. And uh, among the current uh, a, a external collaborator, I want to mention Professor Fratalotti from KAUST, uh, Christian Leoson from University of Iceland uh, and the group uh, of Max Dobeli at the uh, ETH. So this is International Year of Light and uh, I hope that in the spirit of this Year of Light that uh, the metasurfaces indeed will bring uh, some uh, new interesting light to uh, optical tech, uh, technologies. So uh, metasurfaces close for actually flat, op flat optics. This is the uh, rationality. My claim is that while metamaterials and photonic crystal has certainly led to major scientific type of contribution, from a technology point of view, having to uh, be involved in the three-dimensional fab fabrication of these materials doesn't make the technology easier. So. We want to planarize things, just like electronics is a planar type of technology. So I think there is much more future technology, from a technology point of view, if we planarize metamaterials, turn them into metasurfaces, and then it's all about the local control of the phase, the amplitude, the polarization. And we are moving, all the groups work, are moving from uh, metallic type structure to uh, dielectric structure. So essentially, we have to design wavefront control. Uh, an interesting point in the future is to do inverse uh, the uh, design, to design them really efficiently. So you give me a wavefront, and I can de actually design the metasurface that creates a particular wavefront. I will talk about the work my group has been doing on some of these flat components, lenses, collimators, blaze grading and particularly addressing the issue of aberration. Can we make them really achromatic, which is important, like lenses? We'll talk about broadbands. And then a, a tougher question, you know, if we claim that metasurfaces can really do good for technology, we have to show some kind of instrument function going beyond the single component. And we are, I'm referring to one recent uh, uh, example of this, where we have made a polarimeter which uh, works as well as a state-of-the-art polarimeter that you can buy out, but it's uh, much more compact, simple to make, and so forth. And I think this is one interesting direction for metasurfaces. And finally, some science on new uh, metasurfaces where we use disorder. So this is a, basically an old slide, but it tells about that if you decorate a metasurface with a bunch of resonators here, depending on the resonator design, you can be 
you can design the wavelengths that are coming off and then using Huygens principle you can intuitively predict the wavefront of course you have to do then full type of simulation and so forth in particular if you arrange a constant phase gradient for the uh, scattered light you get a gradient metasurface and uh, you can show the so-called generalized Snell law and so forth uh, and um, uh, this is an example of this, of our, you know, our original work, okay, where by designing a gradient metasurface, we were able to show this anomalous negative re, uh, refraction based on the generalized Snell law with a phase gradient, uh, d phi dx. And uh, I want to, this uh, gives, gives me the opportunity to talk about uh, broadband. These are our original metasurfaces. They were designed to work in the mid IR. You see, they're definitely quite broadband, okay, from 5 to 10 micron. The angle of refraction, of course, does depend on the actual wavelength. And uh, so uh, while this is interesting and useful, we want to ask a question. Can we make a structure, actually, where the, where the collimates light for all wavelengths or for a range of wavelengths or at least for a discrete set of wavelengths into one particular angle, okay? So this is uh, other, uh, other, other, other works, including the work from uh, uh, Perdue and the so forth, uh, broadband holograms and so forth. I want to distinguish now uh, the meaning of broadband is, of course, the functionality can extend to a number of wavelengths. Okay, but uh, that's different from achromatic. From achromatic, it means that the actual uh, particular property, key property, like the focal length, does not depend on the actual wavelengths, and that's what we have addressed. Okay, so this is from a recent uh, uh, paper. Uh, we know how refractive optics de depends on wavelengths. We know how diffractive optics does. So the angle of uh, deflection is basically goes in the opposite way as in uh, refractive optics as a function of wavelengths. So with metasurfaces, our goal has been, in fact, to design, for example, collimating metasurfaces that collimate light parallel in a direction independent of wavelengths or uh, lenses that do precisely the same thing with the actual focal length. And uh, so the, uh, you see, the point is about... Uh, uh, an achromatic uh, metasurface, you have to consider the, uh, the phase of the, the scattered phase of the metasurface here, which is by uh, design, basically, with the propagation phase of uh, the light coming off these elements, the phase due to these wavelets here. And we want to collimate the various wavelengths at the same angle here. So the chromatic effects meaning that this angle in general depends on the wavelengths, can be overcome if we compensate the dispersion of the propagation phase with the wavelength dependent phase shift imparted by a metasurface, which is made by some wavelength resonator. So this is the phase shifts are designed so that phi total, I mean these are uh, um, a different wavelengths, okay, you have, this is a compensation type of effect, okay, you see this uh, wavelength dependent phase, which of course depends on position due to these uh, resonators located here, cancels out the effect of the wavelength dependent propagation phase, so it all scatters at the same angle, the different wavelength, we use uh, coupled, uh, we use the electric resonator, uh, typically, they provide multiple resonances. They can dependently tailored, okay? But this is not enough degrees of freedom. So we have actually used a couple of dielectric resonators here to design. And for example, what we want to do here is to design, this is a design FTD simulation for a collimator that scatters a, a light at a parallel at three for three wavelengths, these are three telecom wavelengths, exactly at the same angle of 17, 17 degrees with a comparable scattering F efficient. So by design, you cancel out the uh, uh, dispersion. And this actually, this was fabricated, uh, essentially you have to make an aperiodic metasurface on, 
uh, using, using uh, amorphous silicon on silicon dioxide. This is the processing. This is a, a, a cross section here. You can see the unit cell geometry, which is about S microns. So these are kind of uh, longish uh, waveguides. You can consider them. And these are the actual uh, parameter here. So the total metasurface is about 250 micron square with 250 unit cells. Okay, and uh, indeed uh, you see that the key point is exactly at the angle that you predict, okay, the, uh, uh, the wavelengths are actually uh, scattered all uh, at this particular angle, okay. Uh, there is some zero order here. The, there is some grass here, but uh, by, by a better the, 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 the design of the actual phase function, we can get rid of this. Uh, uh, the efficiency is here limited. The transmission efficiency is of the order of 20-25%, but the metasurface is not in impedance match. If impedance match it, then of course we can go uh, match. Uh, so we have to design then locally, not only the electric sort of, but the magnetic field at uh, the actual surface. And uh, the next challenge was to do the lens, you know, the way... <laughs> We demonstrated this flat uh, lens, which got quite, quite, quite a bit of interest. You design an hyperbolic phase profile here so that all the angles, that for all the angles you converge to the same focus. Uh, it works well. Too bad that uh, you have this wavelength de uh, dependence here. So again, you have to play the trick now to design a phase here, which is wavelength de uh, de dependent in such a way that you compensate uh, for, uh, for, this, uh, for this lambda here, okay? And uh, this indeed uh, can be done. In fact, uh, these flat lenses, uh, this is a nice pictorial uh, re representation of what the chromatic ab ab aberration means. See, the radiance of the spherical wave varies linearly with actually lambda, obviously. And consequently, the focal length also also changes. Okay, so again, we have now to design. Uh, we have to achieve this condition here. Okay, for uh, correcting chromatic uh, uh, aberration, you want to have this uh, product here actually independent of uh, of uh, of wavelengths. Okay. Lambda times pi. Okay, and this is done by... Uh, so in this way, we can achieve the functionality of corrected refractive optics, a different wavelength. This is an acromat. Sorry, something happened here. This is an acromat, which corrects for two wavelengths, for three wavelengths. You can do it for four wavelengths. Well, it's a super acromat. Once you do it for four, for refractive optics, you've done the whole, at least the whole visible uh, range. Uh, so this is, in fact, what our design is based on what I said before. This should be pretty obvious. So we design actually functionally the function of a cylindrical lens. Basically, we focus the three wavelengths along the same line, okay? And this is designed to be a focal length of about two, two millimeter. And incidentally, these metasurface lenses are good. You can make really large, uh, uh, large numerical aperture. So these are the, the simulations here. And uh, now, you, now you can ask what happens at other wavelengths. Well, uh, the design of actually broadband is quite a bit challenging, but there's no showstopper really. Important thing here, you can design it in a way to try to avoid to fall off the cliff, so uh, to speak, okay? But there are some applications where we indeed you only want to certain wavelengths to be actually uh, uh, focused. And uh, this is actually the experiments. Uh, and the most important thing is to actually show what's the minimum. This is a plot of the normalized in uh, intensity here. You see the full width at the half maximal is basically uh, the minimum uh, full width at half maximal for the three wavelengths is at a distance of, uh, which is the focal length of 7. Uh, uh, five millimeters. This was just published in uh, nanoletters. Uh, so I want to uh, 
Now you can think more general elements, other lenses. You can, uh, for example, blaze gratings, uh, uh, light splitters, light benders, and so forth. So this we've used, uh, these dielectric waveguide phase shifter. These are typically a lambda over three, a fraction of a wavelength. And the whole point that by changing the width of these, you can control the effective index, you see, obviously. And uh, if you put them close together now, you see what you have here. This might has a different re, uh, re refractive index than this. So for light propagating this way, you have a certain phase shift delta, delta phi. So you will have a coherent uh, in interference here. This is just, uh, if you like, Young's a, 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 a experiment. You have coherent interference at a certain angle theta, and you have light bending. This is not shown well here. I don't know exactly what happened with the thing. And uh, we have actually... Uh, worked on this and we have used this now to make an actual metagrading okay a metagrading okay which uh, uh, essentially throws uh, the great majority of the light into the plus minus and the plus and minus diffraction order okay and what you want to make sure you see is that uh, uh, not only it's directed only in, in this particular order, but you want to make sure to have broadband type of operation. You see the wavelength dependence of the radiation pattern from this metagrating element has to be the same as the dispersion of the actual grating, which is this one here, okay? So you can design it to be quite close, okay? And so that you can have uh, that you can have this broadband type of operation. In fact, these are the, sorry, I don't know exactly what happened here with my PowerPoint. Seems that nothing is happening, but trust me, the measurements uh, uh, map the simulations very well here. So again, you can have very high functionality. And in fact, uh, uh, see, uh, what you essentially done here, you can consider this a blaze grating, okay, which is actually broadband. Okay, and with high efficiency. Just look at the efficiency. 70% efficiency over a wavelength 1.2 to 1.6 micro. Okay, and uh, the next I want to talk about polarimetry. Okay, this was inspired by early work in my group where we showed that with a plasmonic type of uh, metagrading here, these are apertures in gold, by using, uh, by varying the state of the polarization of light, we could channel uh, we could uh, direct uh, the surface plasma either left or either right, or uh, in the case of right or left, circularly polarized and so forth. And uh, we use this uh, fishbone type of grading here. So this was the idea that uh, inspired us. And uh, uh, I want to say that this, uh, if you want to really have, I can only do just, just a few slides on this, but the detailed uh, count of this polarimeter is going to be in the last day by Dr. Christian Leoson, who's been a key uh, contributor to this area together with my uh, graduate student, uh, Balthasar Mueller. So the idea here, you see, the Stokes polarimeter. So it's all about essentially measuring the Stokes parameters that give you an account of the full state of polarization on the Poincare sphere Plus, it also gives information on degree of polarization of the intensity. Now, these are the commercial polar polarimeters. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but it's pretty obvious that they are complex things. Okay? It doesn't matter what technology you use. You can use uh, multi-beam paths, uh, several uh, pixels, uh, time-varying polarizer. So they all suffer from cost and performance trade-off. The main reason is simple, is system complexity. So we have been thinking, what can we do with metasurface? Per se, to use metasurfaces for polarimeter, there have been other contributions that I mentioned, that I mentioned here, okay? And the promise is they can reduce an uh, entire system to a single optical element. So you say, this is huge. Well, but there are always weaknesses. So the key thing is not per se to demonstrate a motor surface polarimeter, but our goal is 
Let's take the best available there, one of the best polarimeters, and see if with a metasurface we have the advantage of greatly compactifying things okay, while maintaining the same performance. And I want to say the answer is obviously yes, otherwise I wouldn't talk about it probably. And uh, so the idea is, uh, this is essentially the, motor, uh, the polarimeter here, and to create directional scattered field in free space, where the different directions have the information on the encoded uh, polarization. So you really have to design the matrix for this metasurface here. And the polarization is simply deduced, you see, by um, these are the Stokes parameter. This is the input, the scattered output. Okay? It's really about uh, designing a matrix, a device matrix that can be invertible. This is the key thing, and this, in fact, if you like, is a difficult difficulty, the challenge of the design. This was done uh, uh, brilliantly by my graduate student, uh, Balthasar Mueller. And uh, so, so the key point is the Poincaré sphere, you see. The key to do this is to select polarization states on the Poincaré sphere that form an actual, an actual basis, okay? And here is the uh, design that uh, we used, okay, uses this fishbowl grading with these spaces. Again, if you want to know all the details, you can go on Friday at the talk by Dr. Leoson. So here you see we channel the different elliptical polarization states here. You see that form these actual bases here, these four points. Okay, and these are the actual, uh, the actual, uh, the actual simulations. And uh, now the experiment is, uh, conceptually very simple. These are, these are not surface plasmon, okay? These are antennas that are embedded in a uh, dielectric, in an actual polymer on, uh, on uh, silicon, okay? They, uh, it's not important that the scattering is efficient, okay? This is an inline polarimeter. In fact, it does not disturb significantly the propagating, uh, the actual propagating beam. Okay, so you have, uh, uh, you have embedded the antennas uh, here, and then there are the outcoupling, they scatter light in this direction, and you have the outcoupling, uh, the outcoupling uh, gratings here, and then with the objective, you see, you just measure with an actual camera the uh, intensity. And how do you vary the state of polarization? We twist the fiber, okay? And this is the state of polarization. It's given precisely by this equation here, very simple. These are the vectors on the actual Poincaré sphere here, and these are the actual, uh, uh, the actual uh, measurements done for hundreds of different data points here. And uh, we compare this with, uh, simply you can then put a mirror here, and you can uh, take out uh, uh, the metasurface polarimeter, and you can essentially determine the state of polarization with the Thorlabs type of polarimeter, and you can see the data basically exactly overlap over the, uh, each other, and so it's uh, reliable. I think this is a very good success. It shows the potential of uh, metasurfaces for a real system, not just the lens uh, or something like this to replace a whole system. I want to conclude briefly, because I realize I don't have a lot of time, with work done uh, in collaboration with Henning Galinsk, who is now back at the ETH, and Professor Andrea Fratalocchi at KAUST. We have taken advantage of a fairly old technique to produce disordered metasurface by technique using the alloying. If you like, this is a traditional type of uh, metamaterial or a metasurface where the functionality is controlled by these unit cell parameters here. Now, if you have a disorder thing and the disorder is on a sub-wavelength scale, you can essentially create a, uh, a connective network that actually conceptually is basically like a neural network where you can design a certain connectivity. And the connectivity controls the optical property. I would say more generally there are the uh, moments 
of the size distribution that control the optical properties. And uh, so the, you start with, with, uh, with an alloy on silicon nitride silicon, and then we use an etch, which is, uh, um, uh, which is sodium high hydroxide for different times. And what happens, you actually, these are the original papers, goes back to the alloying technique to 1927, the etch takes away the less noble of the, of uh, the elements. So you get about a nanometer per second, so you really can get a control disordered metamaterial, extremely thin, much less than the wavelengths. Then uh, Henning has been doing some beautiful tom uh, tomography taking slices by focused ion beam examining at the SEM and doing a three-dimensional re, uh, re, uh, reconstruction. You can uh, actually monitor the dissolution uh, front by using Rutherford back, uh, backscattering that tells you the distribution of the elements. This is not shown here. And these are the key feature side, you see, the average branch diameter, the mean pore intercept, and so forth. And the point that is, you etch longer and longer, you increase the connectivity of the, of the network, and uh, so, and you can control it in a deterministic way. These numbers are reproducible. I mean, these statistical processes are reproducible every time this is done, even though the local Im implementation is actually different. And so, and these are actually sort of summary of our data you see for short uh, etching or almost no etching. It's a broadband type of re reflector, but as you etch deeper and deeper, you get a very interesting a total absorbing state here. You can call it a certain thickness around 70 nanometer, you have a negligible re reflectivity. Now, you cannot describe this in terms of other mechanisms for total ab uh, absorption, because this is a random type of structure here. But essentially, near the reflectivity minimum, you have a strong localization okay, and, uh, this of the energy. This is, if you like, the pointing vector, the energy density, actually. And uh, the position of the minimum with thickness of the film, the theory tracks very well the experiments. Now, this is interesting, but you know, we would like to do something potentially useful, so this is just... Uh, now, the way you can understand uh, these uh, devices, uh, uh, by the way, I mean, again, it's the local connectivity, okay? And you can actually calculate the density of states, okay? The optical density of, uh, uh, of uh, states, okay? So, as you increase the etching, you can essentially go to, from low connectivity, you can change the connectivity from low uh, to actually high, and uh, uh, for a, a relatively low connectivity here, you get a strong uh, concentration of energy in this localized point, which of course you don't get if you have a high connectivity, and this is, a, uh, this is responsible for this very strong uh, absorption minimum. And uh, then the final thing was the idea is to put on a, a dielectric here. If you put a dielectric here, something remarkable happens, okay? And this is done by atomic layer deposition. And uh, you see, depending on uh, the thickness of this aluminum oxide on this metafilm here, you can dramatically change the actual color. You can cycle to a very large range of colors here. So it's a kind of a new mechanism of structural color. And again, it's uh, related to uh, uh, the fact uh, of the control of the optical properties. Uh, uh, you tend to form a reflectivity uh, minima at certain wavelength here. And for example, if you have a minimum in the, in the reddish or near infrared here, uh, you get enhancement because the eye is more sensitive to these wavelengths. The film would look uh, bluish or actually greenish. And, uh, 
as you can expect, these are very uh, insensitive, you know, depending on the thickness, you know, the uh, reflectivity is actually, uh, uh, the optical properties are not strongly angled the uh, dependent because of the thickness. And uh, simulations were done. They are shown here, FM simulation using console multiphysics. These are actually simple, you know, 2D type of simulation, but they get you an idea of what is happened here. So the incoming light creates surface plasma and polaritons at this interface here, which subsequently couple to local, localize uh, surface plasma mode of the underlying uh, material. And you get again this concentration of energy. So uh, I'm basically, uh, I would like to uh, conclude uh, now by saying, you know, this is a sort of interesting playground. Uh, but I think uh, we can use uh, randomness as a design element. We can call them neuromorphic metamaterial here. And I've shown an interesting uh, uh, example that was actually useful. It's a highly reproducible type of re uh, result where we have a sort of a new mechanism to uh, do structured color. Of course, a lot more research needs to be done, but the technique is very reliable, can be applied to lots of different alloys. And the characterization is also very quantitative. So I want to conclude uh, uh, now about uh, the opportunities for metasurface base planar photonics. I've given a few examples of we can really make a new class of compact broadband component. And not only component, but I showed you one example of an interesting instrument, instrument functionality a high performance polarimeter which is competitive with uh, the existing ones. Ultimately, we want to look on time uh, dependent uh, metasurfaces. There are several groups, including Vlad Chalet's group, that are looking at this. It's extremely promising. Can we do the equivalent of a spatial light modulator? I mean, this, I think, is very important from a system point of view. Can you imagine if we can make an SLM with a speed of nanoseconds? I mean, orders of money to high. The beauty is there is no showstopper. The physics says it can be done, so it's just a matter of time and finding the clever way to do it. But it's quite exciting. And these are the various frontiers uh, that are very excited. You could uh, use the fiber optics platform to put on all kinds of different metasurfaces. We did some preliminary work with George Whiteside's group a few years ago. At the end, you can ask, let's look at it from a purely technology point of view. We have had this interaction, collaboration with actual Google. Uh, Bernard Kress is a chief optical scientist at, uh, at uh, uh, Google, and when he got interested, he says, see, Federico, the key point of these metasurfaces here, because you are doing a really at sub-wavelength sale with a single digital pattern, one mask level, you can create an arbitrary analog phase profile. So we are still doing the, the diff diffractive optics, but in a new angle, and with some uh, clear technological ad uh, advantages, and I hope I've showed you also with some interesting new uh, functionalities. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Uh, questions? David? Sorry, I, I need to repeat. Uh, I need to repeat. It says, to, to what extent can you do a uh, a, a metal lens that uh, uh, you can go really below uh, below the wavelengths, and I would like I would like also to add in a way that it's uh, technologically significant because at the end we have to, and you know, uh, of course we know the the big scientific impact that the ideas of uh, John Pendry had on the perfect lens and the theory behind it, but as you know, that's too sensitive. You know, I mean, to losses, to imbalance between uh, negative and optical and positive space. 
So obviously that is not the way to go practically. There is uh, the thing of super oscillation, okay? But super oscillation has also a, uh, a, some uh, uh, detrimental aspects. So I think this is a very good uh, question, but I hate to disappoint you. I'm going to think more about it. I don't have an obvious, uh, an obvious way to, to think about it. I think uh, uh, there can be a lot of new ideas, but then the question is, do they lead to a better technology at a competitive lens? I'm a bit skeptical here, even though, you know, there are a lot of people who are more creative than we are, you know, and I'm sure <laughs> they'll figure it out. All right. Uh, other questions? Yes. I guess I, I have to think more because it's sort of a, you mentioned singularity, I can only say <laughs> that it works, it works very well because we have the experimental fact, the design, okay, is exactly able to produce the polarization state as measured with a commercial state-of-the-art toll-ups polar, polarimeter. So, Oh, off the top of my head now, I would have to think about it. Maybe we have to, we have to sit uh, you and I after and uh, sort of ponder your, your, uh, your question. But I think the data and the design itself, actually, because the data support the uh, design and the uh, measurements by a commercial polarimeter design is robust and uh, strong. All right. Any uh, further questions? Maybe I, I use this opportunity for the sake of the field. Uh, you, Federica, showed the, basically all the basic elements of optics redone in the flat version. I might ask you to elaborate a little bit on active metasurfaces. What could we expect in that regard? Yeah, I know the question was going to come by some, and it's glad it's coming from Vlad, because probably Vlad can say something, because he's actually uh, very active uh, uh, in it. Again, I think in terms of uh, the vision, it is a very uh, exciting one. And uh, the idea is, uh, for example, we can use tunable materials. They could be change, phase change material, okay, where you modulate uh, the optical properties or the optical or the uh, nonlinear optical uh, properties. I mean, Again, if, if I consider that a metasurface is a device to generate arbitrary wavefront, not only statically, but dynamically, the moment you utter the word dynamically, you have to compare it to the SLM. That's a tough comparison, but it's not tough in terms of T, because SLM are snow, so I think there is a potential of a huge impact. You know, and I would say, I would put that at the very top. But again, I would say at the end, you know, the Clever, the design are important. We like to be clever, invent new things, but at the end we have to confront ourselves with existing technology and things, and we really do better. Can we make something that is, can be uh, commercialized? And uh, so I think in terms of the nonlinear optics and so forth, and also in terms of uh, active, of uh, embedding metasurfaces with uh, luminescent uh, elements, for example. I mean, you could have envy, you can make quantum metasurfaces, put NB centers in there. So there is a lot of potential also in modulating actually the emission uh, property in, in uh, time, but embedded into these things so you can control directionality. So you can see the field is really mushrooming in an enormous direction. Okay, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Capasso for this great talk. <laughs>